it really is a, a it's an honor for me to introduce Joshua Dixon. Uh, he was the national and national faith engagement director for the Biden Harris campaign. Biden's message to the nation as a candidate and now as president has really had deep faith roots. Um, I mean, basically, like in the inaugural address, basically what he was saying is, Americans, we've got to work together. And if somebody needs help, we got to help them out. I mean, <laughs> so it's sort of like the golden rule for, <laughs> for a country in crisis. And, uh, you know, the golden rule is in all the great religions. And um, so Joshua uh, has played a major role in pushing out the Biden-Harris message into all the diverse faith communities and ethical communities, networks in the United States. Um, and uh, um, the, the effectiveness of the Biden camp, it certainly compared to say to the, to I think fair, compared to prior democratic campaigns, it was much more effective. And that really did help to win the election. And then um, Josh, I've said it to you and I think to the students too, that I think, uh, in the president's um, very early days in office, we have seen just a remarkable shift of US public policy through executive actions and his legislative proposal uh, proposals now, uh, we have seen a really remarkable shift in favor of uh, economic justice, uh, racial justice, what's good for poor and near poor people. Um, Josh uh, grew up in a, a loving, conservative, evangelical family. Uh, as a young man, he was moved, presumably by his faith, to work on the south side of Chicago. And that experience as a teacher and an organizer on the south side of Chicago really changed the direction. You know, he, he felt a call to, to move in the direction of uh, a life uh, focused on racial and economic justice. He has, uh, I have experienced that he has tremendous energy <laughs> for fun. I, I, when I was read up, I didn't realize I forgot. What he does for fun is he goes out and run, runs 50 or 100 miles for fun. And then, <laughs> but he brings that also that energy into his uh, work on the intersection between faith and politics. And uh, we, Josh, we very much look forward to hearing uh, what you're thinking and doing in your new position. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, David. Uh, I really appreciate you all having me. Um, uh, and just, I, I, I hope that all of your students know how lucky they are to have uh, someone um, who's so seasoned uh, and has been a part of moving things in our country uh, in, the, in the, the direction of justice for such a long time. Um, uh, so I hope you all know that, that David is, is a real treasure and it was an honor for me to have the chance to work with him um, in a number of ways uh, over the past several months um, and uh, just glad to be here with you all today. Uh, I am a public policy school graduate myself and I've, I have not gone to a seminary um, but have been around a seminary a lot uh, <laughs> my, my entire life and, and I've, I've worked a bunch with Union Theological Seminary and folks there um, on a number of efforts over the years. Uh, so um, yeah, just appreciate y'all being here. I, I wish it could be in person. I was telling David earlier this morning, it would be nice to be in Berkeley, California uh, this time uh, of the year. Uh, I'm, I'm actually not in Washington, DC right now. I'm in uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, and uh, while well, it's it's mountainous, it's, it's cold. I will say just for the record, I'm here in my unofficial personal capacity. Um, but I can speak to a lot of these different things. Uh, and a number of these things, especially on the second part, are all public things that I'll be speaking to. Um, but uh, a couple other pieces uh, for me, um, I, so I did my, my master's thesis uh, on um, ways in which the, uh, the Democratic Party um, could make more inroads um, with people of faith, uh, and then have been involved in this work uh, a bit for the last, um, close to the last decade or so, uh, helped the Young Democrats of America start their first ever faith and values program back in 2011, um, and then worked on the Obama-Biden campaign uh, out of the DNC and then Ohio in 2012, and have just kind of really stayed connected into the political work um, and have found it really interesting and fascinating. Um, so I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to jump into that. Uh, and what I wanted to do is start off with a, some just some quick background um, about the landscape uh, when it comes to faith and politics. And some of this 
will not be new to anybody, um, but I think it's, it's helpful grounding um, even for me as I um, kind of share some of this information. Um, so uh, in our country, um, roughly 74% uh, of people identify with a religious background, it kind of depends on um, which uh, new survey you look at, but it's somewhere between 70%, 75%, um, and 72% of people say faith is important to their lives. So um, regardless of uh, whether we are people of faith or not, it's clearly something that uh, is, is still a real factor for many folks, uh, how they identify um, uh, where their values come from, uh, how they associate with different things, especially in the, in the political space. Um, I think it's also interesting uh, to look at, and I'm just gonna try to share my screen for a second here. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, here you can kind of see like a quick snapshot, not including 2020, but um, going back to 2000, uh, a little bit about um, uh, the ways in which different faith demographics broke down. Uh, and I think what's what's interesting is to see is to see swings here uh, and to see the ways in which, um, you know, look at the Catholic vote, for example, uh, in 2000, you know, it went a little bit more towards Gore. Um, in 2004, it swung away back towards Bush, was relatively decisive in his victory. Um, in 2008, it swung back to Obama, it was more decisive in his victory. Um, then it swung, or it, Obama maintained uh, um, a bit, lost some on the margins. Uh, he also lost um, his victory wasn't as decisive in 2012. It was still pretty decisive, but not as resounding as his 2008 victory. Um, and then it dropped a bit uh, for, for Hillary Clinton in, um, in 2016, um, and, and I'll get to 2020 shortly. Um, but you, know, you can kind of see in here uh, some other different faiths. Um, uh, and you know, as you think about just the ways in which these swings happen, the ways in which um, voters who affiliate with these backgrounds are a part of uh, key voting blocks, especially in key states, given that we live in the United States with the, the electoral colleges it is, you know, um, it really, uh, it really underscores the idea that um, politics is very much a margins game. It's very much about how are you uh, winning key voters on the margins, either maintaining um, your share of the vote on the margin uh, or or persuading more people on the margin. And it's really this combination of both persuasion and mobilization. So you wanna turn out your base, you wanna persuade as many people as possible. Um, and I think um, the, the angle of looking at um, how do you persuade uh, voters who are motivated by faith is, is a really fascinating one for me and I've done a lot of reading on it. Um, in uh, what's interesting about like some of the, land, the, the context for this election uh, is there were some big changes between 2016 and 2018. Um, and you know, I think folks, one of the huge storylines of course in 2016 was what evangelical turnout for Trump and um, even seeing his share of the Catholic vote was, was pretty significant um, and his share of a number of other votes. Um, but in 2018 in the midterms, uh, Democrats national share of the vote increased five percentage points among Catholics, six percentage points among evangelicals, three percentage points amongst Protestants and other Christians, eight percentage points amongst Jewish voters, and four percentage points amongst Muslims. Um, whereas from 2012 to 2014, Democrats share the vote decrease amongst each of those groups, uh, a trend which continued in 2016, as you just saw um, from that table, aside from Jewish voters. Um, so these are just interesting trend lines to follow, uh, especially as you're preparing for a presidential campaign and thinking about where are, where are our opportunities. Uh, I'm gonna show, um, I'm going to show my screen again real quickly um, and just sort of paint a little bit more of a picture of the environment we were walking into in 2020. So, you know, when we really started to ramp up uh, a lot of this work, I had been supporting um, the work of, the, of uh, uh, President Biden um, for a while, actually going back to before he entered into the primary. Uh, his campaign manager was uh, my former boss um, in the Obama campaign in 2012. So we've been talking about things for a while. That said, I didn't come on full time on the campaign um, until later on and in really post primary. So, you know, when I was looking at this in, in June, July, as I was preparing to, to start this job, trying to look at the current environment. And obviously, a lot of things have been happening. You had 
um, COVID hit our country and, and really um, spread massively. Um, you had the murder of George Floyd um, uh, and uprisings around racial justice. You saw a lot of different contextual factors, um, economic factors, other things like that. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is paint a picture of like, what is, what's the environment that we're entering into and, and where, how can that inform where our opportunities are? I'm not going to go in detail about all these things, but you can see, you know, some of these things are what we look at, right? Um, so, you know, one is, uh, you know, we saw that most religious Americans did not view Trump's handling of the response to George Floyd murder positively. Um, not surprising, uh, but it is interesting, especially to look at um, Trump's response or Trump's handling of the response to George Floyd's murder amongst some of his base voters, right? And what does that say to us? It says, hey, like folks really aren't, um, you know, they're, they're not all, just totally latched on to him. There are, you know, even if it's two, three, four percentage points um, worth of persuadables, it tells us just some more information about them. And so this is all really, really helpful. Um, we saw Trump's confidence in Trump's handling of COVID-19 uh, dropped and dissatisfaction with it increased among several sizable religious groups between March and May of 2020, uh, including folks that were key to his base. Um, saw that his favorability ratings among several religious groups uh, had dropped by double digits between March and May of 2020. Um, obviously correlated with a lot of things happening in the country. Uh, we saw that um, white Christians, who you know, account for a lot of his base, uh, that live in counties more affected by COVID-19 were less likely to view him favorably than those living in less affected counties. Um, we saw a sizable proportion of Americans say that their faith had grown stronger during COVID-19, which is just an interesting data point for us to be thinking about in terms of messaging that could resonate. Um, and, and then there's just other things, too, uh, in the environment where we saw, you know, as of June 2020, that a large percentage of his base didn't, didn't view him as religious um, and that there were some implications uh, around that um, for uh, how we could appeal um, in terms of values messaging. I share these not for you all to look at the ins and outs of them. Um, this is all publicly available information, but more so to give a sense of like some of the things that we look at and some of the trend lines that were that were helpful for us as we kind of looked through and thought about, hey, like where are our big opportunities? And for us, you know, obviously at the national level, it's helpful to see these different um, to try to make gains on the margins, but really the state level, when you're talking about presidential elections in the US it is where it's significant. Uh, and so I wanna share this table too, cause it gives you a little bit of a snapshot as well of some of the states that I was thinking about and looking at. Um, so you can see uh, in the left-hand column, the name of the state, um, as well as Trump's margin of victory in 2016, percentage wise and then raw vote wise. Um, which gave us an idea of like, hey, you know, all things held equal, if we could make some slight shifts, what would, how might that play out? You know, if you can shift um, uh, the Catholic vote by five percentage points, if you can, if you can have, um, you know, 5% higher voter turnout amongst uh, Black Protestant voters. Um, and, and just know too, and, and, and I have this included up here, um, is that because of exit poll data, because of limitations in exit poll data, uh, we just don't have data for as many groups as we would like. So there are a lot of groups in here um, that I would like to have more information about, but usually we just work off of what we have. Um, and so we definitely have limitations here. So when, when there are groups not represented, it's just because we don't have state specific snapshots um, based on exit poll sample sizes that are publicly available. Um, but you can just see here again, you, know, you can see these states um, and the, the, the margin of victory from last time, then you can see, according to polling, um, the percent who say that religion is somewhat or very important in their life, uh, which gives us, uh, again, just a little bit of an idea of the landscape, and then just opportunities um, that we're looking at, and you can just kind of see here, if you use Michigan, Michigan as an example, um, you know, uh, we got 39% of the Catholic vote in 2016, um, which was down from 44%. You know, if you're talking about a state where Catholics make up 1.8 million people, um, that's a, a sizable shift in terms of uh, impacting the outcome in Michigan. Um, and, and same thing with a number of these other constituencies. And, and even in Michigan, um, you know, I, I had talked to a lot of my, folk, my friends on the ground um, who are, you know, who, who work in the, across the state and who, uh, one of my friends is a state rep. And, and, and they actually pointed out um, this uh, sizable population of uh, Chaldean uh, and Iraqi Christians 
um, that had swung really heavily for Trump, um, but that had had some really negative experiences with Trump uh, around immigration issues um, and deportations and whatnot. And, um, you know, so we wanted to hear from them and, and hear uh, a little bit about how we could work together um, and, and show that, you know, Joe Biden would be a lot better for um, their community in a number of ways, including refugees who are coming in. So um, again, this is just a little snapshot to give an idea of some of the things that we're, that we're thinking through when we look at the overall context um, and when we look at how to determine where to lean in, because you're always, you always have limited time and resources um, and you want to go where the bang for the buck is going to be the highest. Um, so on that note, some of our major strategic considerations, um, aside from, you know, again, the idea that this is a margins game uh, and that you need to know who you're trying to mobilize and who you're trying to persuade. And actually, if I would have, if I would have scrolled down there a little bit more, um, you'd see in some states in 2016, we actually saw uh, really depressed, like uh, we saw that um, black Protestant voter turnout was, was depressed in places like Wisconsin um, and a couple other states where it was much lower than it had been in 2012. Um, and that actually accounted for um, a lot of Trump's margin of victory is just folks who didn't end up voting. Um, and so we're always trying to think about this combination of mobilization and persuasion. Um, we're also thinking about winning the narrative uh, and how um, we can really speak with the language of values and emotions when it comes to connecting with voters in general but faith motivated voters in particular, there's a book called The Political Brain, which is really fascinating. And some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may have read it. It really talks about the psychology of how people make their choices in the voting booth, how they form and craft their political views and things like that, and, and just what appeals to them. And it speaks a lot about the language of values and emotions and how um, arguments based on math, petty things just don't resonate as well and are not as effective, um, whereas, uh, when you're when you're when you're trying to um, run campaigns and win people over either to your candidate or to your cause, it's really effective um, to appeal from a value standpoint. Um, and I know you know David knows this all too well uh, because this has been the work he's been doing his entire life. Um, I know that you all probably this resonates a lot. It resonated a lot with me, but it was really helpful for me when I was in grad school to see the actual science behind it and how much it impacts things. And then thereafter to watch it play out in different political contests and other stuff like that. Um, but that's really, really important. Um, and just a couple other things on st strategic considerations. You have to make people know they matter to you. And I think if, if you don't do that, um, you can people can feel really turned off by you and actually um, want to tell their friends not to support you. Uh, that's a very big thing, and I'll get to that in a little bit when it when it comes to this this space. Um, and then you know, building trust through trusted messengers, and this is this is such a key thing. You know, like me as one person, I am a straight white progressive evangelical male um, who was born uh, to a middle income family in upstate New York. My perspective is and will always be um, limited because of different identifiers, different experiences, things like that. I will not be able to speak to every single constituency in every group um, in the same way that a credible voice from their community will be able to. And so really thinking about how to build support and how to build partnerships and collaborations with folks who can be trusted messengers to communities um, and who can really validate uh, the, the work that you're trying to do um, and uh, be, be spokespeople um, for, for the cause on the whole. Um, so those are some, some major strategic considerations from my end. I would say, you know, when it comes to goals on the whole, um, our, our big target was to increase our margin, margins with key constituencies in our focus states by building a historically broad, robust, and inclusive coalition of faith-motivated voters. And I think that was one of the pieces for us. Um, we really wanted to live into the values of our candidates and um, being... Uh, stressing diversity and inclusion was a huge part of that. Um, and so uh, from the get-go, that was a big piece of how we operated. And, I, and I'll touch on how we did that in just a second. Um, but we we really entered into, once we started the campaign and got up and moving, 
we really entered into our work with this operating philosophy um, where that was kind of anchored in three main points. And, and we've talked about this with reporters all the time, um, but it was really important for us to get this out there. Um, that point one is that people of faith must feel valued and respected by our campaign. That was something that uh, we had heard that folks uh, hadn't always felt from democratic campaigns um, and that we knew was really, really important uh, if we were gonna have a, uh, try to have a foothold and win over new voters um, and even to mobilize our base. Um, two, we knew that we had to ask people of faith to vote for us. Uh, and Amy Sullivan wrote this great book called The Party Faithful. Um, and in the book, you know, she does the exhaustive research on um, the ways in which uh, Democrats have uh, worked to engage faith motivated voters and this thing called the God Gap, which is um, how people of faith perceive uh, the Democrats as being much less friendly towards religion. It's a perception thing. Um, and one of uh, Amy's kind of big points is um, too often uh, Democrats don't even ask people of faith for their votes. And so for us, one of our one of the core points of our operating philosophy was we're going to ask people for their votes. Um, and then third was we wanted to give people a reason to to vote for us rather than just to vote against our opposition. Um, so those things really anchored our work. And then we had several strategic pillars that kind of guided the actual things that we did. On the whole, the issue that that, that rose to the top most consistently was addressing systemic racism, especially in the wake of George Floyd. Um, but some of that research that we did, these conversations all really helped with that. And so our argument was, um, that this was the real religious issue of the election for the voters that we were really trying to persuade, um, where it would really, really make a difference. Uh, we also worked to get our message out through a very aggressive press engagement strategy, um, through paid media, uh, through interviews that our team did and that other um, surrogates did, through op-eds, um, through endorsements, through videos from our candidates, um, through videos from surrogates, like President Obama uh, and more. So the narrative piece was a really, really big focus for us, well, especially during COVID, especially during um, this strange campaign where everyone is home and everyone's on screens all the time. Um, the second big piece was like, we wanted anyone anywhere who wanted to be a part of our work to have ongoing opportunities to do that. Um, we, we hosted different types of events. Uh, we had different types of coalitions and, and David saw this um, firsthand. Yeah. You know, we had evangelicals for Biden. We had LGBTQ believers for Biden. We had AAPI Christians for Biden. We had Hindu Americans for Biden, Jewish Americans for Biden, Muslim Americans for Biden, um, Sikh Americans for Biden, progressive believers for Biden. Um, just this basically all of the, the, the different identities and, and different individuals we worked with uh, across the board, um, we just worked with them to ensure that they felt represented and included. Uh, and so we hosted events for all these different groups, young believers for Biden, women believers for Biden. Um, we hosted every single group that I've mentioned and more, we hosted events with, and, and some of them multiple. Um, because we really wanted to show, again, the inclusivity of this campaign um, and the way in which uh, our work um, uh, really uh, was focused on engaging um, uh, this broad, diverse group. Um, we also provided folks with regular opportunities to hear from key speakers um, and to take action with the campaign. That was a big thing. We're always pushing, here's how you can get involved. Here's how you can phone bank. Here's how you can text bank. Here's how you can do other things that are helping get the message out. Um, we focused on uh, sharing articles and social media that um, other people could share as well. Uh, we, we hosted uh, gospel concerts. Um, uh, I think we did, we did um, seven gospel concerts across multiple different weekends, um, just a different type of medium, especially during COVID, um, where, you know, so many folks are, are attending services from home. We worked with a bunch of different artists on that um, and, and surrogates. Uh, we, we provided people with the opportunity to virtually deploy to states and basically, you know, go and be a part of our Florida team, go and be a part of our Michigan team, and you can do it from home, you know, and they would work with our, with our teams there um, and more. So we basically wanted anyone who was looking to be a part of this work, we wanted them to have ways to take action um, and to actively be involved in this. Um, I'm sorry. Third is uh, we did nonpartisan voter registration and turnout. That was a big thing. We worked with a lot of different congregations on that, um, and you know, just really, uh, especially with all of the the different threats um, to uh, uh, 
voters all around the country, um, particularly voters of color um, and marginalized communities uh, from our opposition. Um, we really wanted to make sure that uh, folks had the, the, the chance to do that and to partner with us this way for, for 501c3s. Um, we, we had a, a big focus, number four, on leader engagement and mobilization. Um, so I mentioned we hosted listening sessions. Uh, we had different advisory groups. So for those coalitions that I mentioned, we had advisory groups, uh, kitchen cabinet groups we met with regularly to hear from, to work with, um, to collaborate with on, on different initiatives, different events, things like that. Um, we really stressed endorsements. And, uh, you know, we, we weren't just trying to go for, um, you know, uh, some big name endorsements that would, you know, just really splash and all that. We were, we were focused on getting as many endorsements as possible. Um, and this is a thing that you don't usually get from faith leaders, but on this campaign, um, given the nature of it, we just figured, hey, let's go out and ask. And once we started asking, more and more folks came out of the woodwork um, and were like, yeah, I want to take a moral stand. This is this election is not, it's not about politics for me. It's not about partisanship. It's about principle. Um, and so, you know, for us, we really stressed that and, and it resulted in some great press coverage as we rolled those out because we achieved a historic number. Um, we also uh, worked with folks to get op-eds out there. We pro provided leaders with speaking opportunities, media appearances, and just ways to amplify their message um, and their support for, for, for our ticket. Um, we also highlighted common good policies um, that we felt were in strong contrast to the current administration, like racial equity, fighting poverty, um, uh, our stances on immigration and refugees, our approach to COVID-19, healthcare, climate, and more. Um, and then we, we very much stressed uh, on the, the, the next point, um, integration of our work across the campaign. So uh, we worked with the paid media team to do a seven-figure ad buy um, that was focused on uh, key faith communities in swing states. Um, we worked with the communications team on a number of different things that they were doing. Uh, we worked with the speech writing team um, uh, to insert things when, you know, different, uh, whether it was our, uh, one of our candidates or another key surrogate was um, going to be delivering a message to a, a particular community. You saw one of those speeches um, in the, the Poor People's Campaign address that uh, President Biden did. We worked with our digital team um, to get uh, content out there um, and to ensure that uh, we were amplifying our values messaging. Um, we worked across the, co the national coalition team that I worked on. So I worked with all of my other colleagues, I worked with our women's outreach director, worked with our Latinx outreach director, worked with our API outreach director, worked with our um, uh, Black Americans outreach director, worked with our LGBTQ outreach director, and everyone. We did events together and really just tried to show the intersectionality of our work. Um, we worked with our policy team, we worked with our field team, and more. And then um, the final piece on this is we worked with all we worked with all of our swing states, all of our battleground states to try to replicate this programming at the state level. So I had uh, regular uh, weekly or more frequently um, touch points with folks from 15 different swing states who we were working with, um, providing guidance to and supporting. Um, so that's kind of a rundown. Um, what were the results? Uh, at the end of the day, um, we hosted 112 national events in three months with more than 3 million attendees, uh, including uh, seven virtual gospel concerts. Um, we secured more than 2,500 faith leader endorsements, a record number for a Democratic presidential campaign. Um, we secured 130 plus earned media stories, including in the New York Times, CNN, NPR, Washington Post, Christianity Today, Associated Press. Um, and we had op-eds uh, that were written about um, their own personal faith journeys from both of our candidates. So uh, we had a, an, an op-ed from President Biden, which I think you all read uh, in Christian Post. And then we had an op-ed from Vice President Harris um, in Desert News in the lead up to the vice presidential debate. Um, we also ran a seven figure, as I mentioned before, ran a seven figure uh, faith ad budget, um, the highest of any Democratic presidential campaign in modern history. Um, and we, uh, I, on the, the number side, um, we increased the national share of the Catholic vote uh, by six points, um, and the Catholic vote accounted for roughly um, 22 to 25% of the electorate. Uh, we, we saw a 12 point gain amongst white Catholics. Um, we saw our share of the evangelical vote uh, go up. Uh, it kind of depends on which, which exit polls, but anywhere from a, a few points um, which is kind of what our target was, all the way up to seven points. Um, and then when you look at the state level, which is really what matters the most, we saw our share of the evangelical vote in Michigan double, um, which 
way more than accounted for the margin of victory. Um, we saw our share of the evangelical vote in Georgia triple, um, which the evangelical vote accounts for uh, about a third of the electorate there. Um, and if you recall, it was a pretty close, pretty close race there. Um, we saw a nine point gain amongst Latter-day Saint voters in Arizona. Um, we did a whole bunch of Latter-day Saint engagement as well, um, uh, where uh, Latter-day Saints make up about 5% of the, the electorate. And um, those, those results accounted for uh, raw vote gains more than the margin of victory in each of those states. Um, I, I do wish I had more exit poll data on like specific religious snapshots because we just don't have it for a lot of groups. And that's the unfortunate thing is like, they'll pull them for some of the larger groups, um, but in general, we just don't get a lot of it. Uh, that's the only reason why I am referring to these specific groups and not to others. It's just because we don't have the information, but um, clearly we saw a big impact in our work. With, uh, uh, I was gonna read several headlines from some different articles that came out of the campaign. Um, uh, in Politico wrote an article uh, titled, How Biden Swung the Religious Vote. And they said, Trump's team thought religious-minded voters would save him in key states. They now appear to have turned away just enough for him to lose. Um, New York Times, an article titled, the, the Faithful Voters Who Helped Put Biden Over the Top. And the author wrote, uh, Joe Biden succeeded in his mission to end Donald Trump's presidency, and he did so in part because of the wise, persistent, and strategic ways campaign related to faith. This was not inevitable. Um, and then Newsweek uh, ran an article um, that the, the, the headline says it all, evangelicals in the Midwest who ditched Trump cost him the election, early data suggests. Uh, I told you I geek out on this stuff and get really into it. Uh, before I even started on the campaign, before I even before my even job, my, my job description was even up, I wrote like a 15 page heavily detailed memo that I spent like 40 hours on and it was fun. Um, so uh, I get really into this stuff so I can, I can talk too much. Um, for me, the, the day I decided I was gonna work on the 2012 campaign, I didn't know what my job was gonna be. I had no idea how I was gonna get connected in, but I was at an event at the Kennedy School and Eric Cantor, uh, who some of you all remember, he was the um, majority leader in the House at this time. So he was number two to John Boehner. He came and spoke. And I remember someone asked him um, about the Ryan, the Paul Ryan budget cuts. And they were like, you know, how could you support something like this that has such a, such a detrimental impact uh, on the poor and vulnerable at home and abroad? And he said, trade-offs. You got to make trade-offs. And I was like, that right there is what's at stake, is, is, is that perspective. And, and that just goes against so much of what I personally stand for. Um, and, 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 and I see that when it comes to how folks are going to actually legislate and work um, to provide more opportunity for the most vulnerable um, and, 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 and to try to address the historic inequities that exist in our country, I just saw such a contrast there. And so when I joined the campaign, that was a lot of what we talked about was, was that values contrast. So we should talk a lot about poverty and you know, David can speak so much to this because he was working uh, on this congressional hunger fast and on all these different things opposing the Ryan budget cuts. Um, but you know, that was a big frame for us. I remember when I went around Ohio and had people, had surrogates come in, you know, usually I would go like, pick someone up from the airport, you know, whether it was like Vicki Kennedy or Senator Dick Durbin or someone else. And, you know, they'd have their talking points from, from their, their team, but they'd say, what do you think I should talk about? You know, as we're like driving to an event. And I always said, like, you should talk about the contrast in um, how the President Obama's uh, approach to caring for poor and vulnerable um, is just so much more aligned with the values of people of faith and what we see from the things that Romney Ryan support. Um, so I think like it's, it's very much, um, you know, adjusting your strategy for the context. You have a unique, I think a unique perspective on American faith communities. I don't think, is there any other institution that um, relates to this whole, <laughs> all the, all the, all these different networks of uh, people, uh, at least a lot of them, find their mm -hmm. way uh, to the White House, and also um, at least the Obama White House and uh, and now the Biden White House in seek them out. You know, they're inviting in different faith communities, and I don't. 
Is there any other institution in the country that brings together all the, you know, you know, when, when uh, Obama had kind of faith leaders together, I mean, sometimes he'd do a, a Muslim event and a Christian event and but sometimes you'd bring people together. And I was struck, my God, there are all these people. <laughs> I, I didn't even know there were these people. I, I just think your perspective is unique, but am I wrong? Are there other institutions that relate to everybody the way the White House faith-based office does? I mean, I, I think that it, it's definitely a, a unique um, perch and provides unique convening power. You know, I, I think yeah. other, other organizations have their own unique convening power. Um, and other institutions do too, but but ours is a unique in and of itself as well. Um, you know, again, just just being being a place where you know we do work to represent um, all Americans and people of all mm -hmm. beliefs and backgrounds, including the non-religious. You know, and, and that's been yeah. a, a big piece. And, and even like on the campaign, we had humanists for Biden. And I worked closely with the humanist <laughs> community um, as they were getting out there, and you know, um, well, it's faith-based and, and neighborhood partnerships. That's yeah, important. yeah, and, and now you I know, didn't like um, to name it, you know, years ago, but it's a brilliant <laughs> name because it also yeah. has neighborhood because people are at the people live in neighborhoods, so it for doesn't sure. sound yeah. like, it doesn't sound like it's all just national manipulation. It's yep. connecting to people where they are. Yeah. If what, yep. one other thing I'm struck by. Just recently, uh, because of this course, is that presidents can influence American religion. I've always thought about it the other way, you know, that 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 churches were trying to influence politicians. But mm. uh, what really struck me was the one thing we read that uh, an article by uh, Robert Putnam at Harvard talked about. Um, how abortion and uh, gay marriage became so prominent. Uh, Putnam also says that more people hear about poverty and hunger from the pulpit than about abortion and gay marriage. Mm -hmm. So how did it happen that those two issues just became, um, that a lot, of believe, a lot of religious people think those are the two issues that God cares about. And, uh, he attributes it to the Bush campaign, the George W. Bush campaign in the in 2014, that they they advertised we're the, you know I am going we are the party that's going to fight abortion, oppose abortion and gay marriage, and with a picture of a little church on a hill, you know. So we are the religious party, and a lot of people bought it, not just to, to vote for him, but it also changed how they think what they think in fact is religious. And I think, uh, I mean, Trump, I'm, I think Trump's, Trump has done a lot of damage to religion in America. And I think Biden's having a salutary effect. You know, he's, you know, maybe partly the opposite of talking about poverty and race. And he, he does such a beautiful job of doing it in a non geeky way, you know, just talking about helping out, helping out people who need help when we when when we have when we need help helping each other well i mean um, he's he's authentic you know i think yeah, that's the thing and we talked about that a lot during the campaign is like he's pretty authentic to who he is and what his values are and he's someone who you know he he's he's gonna care about you and want to know what's happening with your family whether you're catholic like he is or whether you're jewish or whether you go to ame church or you have no faith at all um you know he he has so many relationships. He cares about people deeply. Um, and he, you know, really, he empathizes and he seeks to connect. And, and, and that's been, that's been such a hallmark part of who he yep. is. It's um, really true. He, I mean, you know, um, with this particular situation. And I think that, again, he's, he goes, he goes to mass. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know how many times, I don't know how long it'll be until he has gone to religious services more than the past four or five presidents combined in terms of like showing it. But for him, he just basically, he goes every week and sometimes he goes multiple times a week. I still think that he's gone more times than the weeks he's been president. Wow. Um, I'm pretty sure because he went on inauguration day. He's gone every Saturday or Sunday. He was at Camp David one week and I don't know um, if he, if he went then, but he, uh, he went during Ash Wednesday too. 
you know, so, but I mean, it, but, but it's because it, it's not because he's trying to show off, you know, he doesn't go and talk about it in the same way that our people do. It's just, that's who he is, you know, and he did on the campaign and he'll continue to do that. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's a really fascinating case study and will be interesting to see, you know, how this plays out over yeah. time. Um, but yeah, I think his authenticity that he brings to it uh, really, um, you know, speaks volumes. I was on a call earlier today where someone said, you know, as faith leaders, this is our this is our time to stand up and show what we really what we really are about, what our values truly are. Um, when it comes to all the things this legislation does around combating child poverty, around um, uh, increasing uh, wages and um, closing the wealth gap uh, for historically disadvantaged communities, for communities of color, what this does for frontline workers, um, what this does for uh, to to work on closing gaps um, in uh, related to learning loss and things along those lines, what this does um, around expanding healthcare access, um, access to, to, to capital for small business owners and more. So um, we're right at the hour. Uh, I know that uh, um, David's got to turn it over, um, but you know, hopefully that was just a good snapshot uh, of you know, where we are today, um, how the White House is orienting towards this uh, and um, just where, where the potential lies. Um, and all I'd say, I think it's still up to us to actualize that. Um, so that's the task at hand, um, and I'll turn it back to David. 